My name is uh, Kevin Kadivi. I'm a medical physicist at Austin Cancer Centers. Uh, I thank you for your time uh, to attend this short presentation, and I apologize for the technical issues we had at the very beginning. Uh, if during my presentation you have any issues, please don't hesitate to interrupt and pose your question. So as the title of my presentation implies, uh, we'll be talking about accepting an HDR source for Electa microselectron. And very briefly, I worked at Austin Cancer Centers. We employ uh, six Linux and have a fairly active brachytherapy program, which entails both LDR prostate seed implant as well as uh, HDR covering the spectrum of uh, GYN, skin, breast. So the first slide shows the workflow for uh, delivery of an HDR source. It shows that in a, a nuclear reactor, iridium-191 is bombarded with uh, neutrons. Iridium-192 gets generated. And then it gets transported using uh, different means of transportation to its destination, which in this case could be your country. And then, of course, under the watchful eyes of the proper government agency, it gets transferred from the port to your hospital. You use it for about three months or so. And then by that time, the source has decayed considerably. Let's say we typically receive our sources or our source in activity of about 11 to 12 Curie by the time that it has decayed to, to high fives or well actually high four curies or low five curies then we would consider that source spent and then we return that spent source to the vendor through proper channels so that's the workflow of how the source hdr source gets to our destination and is sent back to the vendor regarding some safety issues the hot link that appears at the bottom of the slide could help different participants in different parts of the country to look at IAEA's safety standards and see if they have any question about the details of this process which I just described. The second slide shows a brief summary of what I just said and the reason I included that in my slide and I'd be more than happy to share this upgraded uh, PowerPoint presentation is that sometimes colleagues, patients, physicians asks us, you know, where is it this Iridium Y92 for HDR is coming from? And this is a short description of where it's actually coming from, namely bombardment of I, uh, Iridium 191, as I briefly explained, how it's manufactured, and then what's the decay pattern for that. So I won't go through this, but you're more than welcome to study this and share that with the interested colleagues. So I work in Austin, Texas, and I wanted to briefly explain to you what happens when we are preparing to receive an HDR source. And then if you want, you, we can open uh, this discussion to your clinic and see how you can prepare the workflow. In the state of Texas, we typically receive an email from the vendor that, hey, this radiation source is coming your way. It's called a reciprocity request. So state of Texas knows this source is coming. We, we know that uh, we are coming, that the source is coming. And then step two explains that when we should be expect, expecting the source. Again, we re exchange the sources about every three months or so. In this second email, we are given the exact date we should be expecting the source, plus or minus one day. The step number three shows that what we do when the source actually reaches our clinic. So what we typically do is as soon as the source reaches our clinic, we secure that in the hot lab and we look at the shipper's declaration, make sure that the proper source has been sent to us and we measure the transport index which is the dose rate at one meter from the, at four cardinal angles 
from the source container, which is usually a white bucket in our case and lead lined. So the service engineer usually shows up a day or two after the source arrives here, goes through the source exchange, namely removes the old source, puts in the new source, does all the proper radiation safety issues about leakage, all the tests that's necessary. Physics follows up by reviewing some of those measurements that the engineer did and we do our own tests. And then we declare, okay, great, your job is done, engineer, thanks very much. And the source is now prepared to be sent back to the vendor. And that's what step number four here explains. When we send the source back with all the proper documentations on the container, of course, we receive an email from the vendor that we received the spent source. And that's great because that closes the loop and it makes sure that the source is back to where it is to, to, to get, namely the vendor. We at stage, at step number five, I have outlined some of the guidelines we follow, task group 56 and 59 here in US that may or may not exactly apply to your site. But this also offers a good idea as to why we do the things we do here. For the colleagues who are outside of USA, I have indicated a couple of links here. And by referring to these two links, you will see the code of conduct on safety and security of radiation sources. I especially encourage you to look at page uh, 15 and table one and match that against your local requirements. And you can do that after the presentation. And I also like to mention that if you have any question during the presentation or afterwards, please do contact me and I'd be more than happy to share what I know. So I've organized the presentation into different sections. Uh, are we sure the correct source has been sent to us? Not iodine-125, but uh, Iridium-192. Once we receive the source and we want to do our tests, our dual position, dual time, source error, current strength, timer errors, and all of those things are in place or not. So let's go over each one of them through the slides that's coming up. So section A uh, refers to, we want to make sure that the actual source has been sent to us. It's very unusual if a mistake is committed by the vendor in sending us the wrong source or wrong activity, but it can happen. So as uh, medical physicists and to do uh, due diligence, we look at the shipping declaration and we go over the details indicated there to make sure that Iridium 192, let me see if I can enlarge this. Iridium 192 is sent to us. It's a type two package. What the expected transport index could be. And this is one of the discrepancies I briefly wanted to point to here. It says, transport index should be 0.7, that's dose rate at one meter. The vendor booklet says 0.6, and we try to say with 0.6. So some minor discrepancies might occur. I encourage you to open a uh, discussion with the vendor and try to resolve this. We haven't been able to, do, to resolve this issue. Maybe you could. And then making sure that it's coming from the vendor and it's coming to us here at Austin. So just a cursory review of the documents on the container that holds the radiation source would be very helpful. Okay, as far as one of the first tests that we do after the source is exchanged is uh, dual position accuracy. This is a very important test that we do immediately after the source exchange and every day that we want to do an HDR. So essentially we want to make sure that the source goes to where we want it to go. If I ask it to travel to certain dual position and stay there for a certain period of time, then jump two millimeters or five millimeters or one centimeters, it'll do that. So I've posed the question and the rest of my presentation is also formed in the, in the form of questions and answers and a few suggestions. So if I may, if I may, I quickly ask 
just read the question I post here. So the question we are trying to answer is that after an HDR source exchange, does the source travel to the designated uh, points? And the tolerance is one millimeter. And the answer for those of us who use uh, treatment control system and the ELECTA system is that we program the treatment control system to have the HDR source travel to four dual positions, one centimeter apart. So for, for example, I start at 1500 and I say go to 1500, 1490, 1480, and 1470. And if I want to repeat that test next day, I usually skip one dual position and I start at 1450. So again, four dual positions are uh, marked. And you can see the marks here too. Let me enlarge the screen. So you can see here that in this film strip that's placed into the source position check ruler, we ask the source to go to 1500 and then jump one centimeters, four dual, uh, four burnt marks are made here. And then the next day I skip this and I say, let's start at 1450, do it for four dual positions. Then uh, next day I say, start at 1400. So this way we can separate the burnt marks and we can mark them the date uh, of the uh, measurement. Now, the film strips are provided by the vendor and we find it to be somewhat expensive. They are laser cut, very nicely uh, marked, but we came up with a more cost effective uh, solution in that we purchased uh, large EPT2 films. We marked them manually. Granted, there's there could be up to half a millimeter uh, of error in marking them. Then we cut the film into strips here. So it's a homemade film strip, if you will. And that's a dimension, one and a half centimeters in width and about 20 centimeters long. And then we use that in the source position check ruler. And we go through this dual position check on a regular basis. Each film takes about five of these. So one week, if you will. And then uh, we mark them, we remove it and replace it with the next homemade film strip. So it's, as I said, it's a relatively cost effective solution in using film strip for dual position check ruler. So we look at these burnt marks and we want to make sure that uh, the source has gone to where we want it. And is it within plus or minus one millimeter? And we want to make sure that, and I will refer to this again in the future slides, that because of the heat that's built up in the HDR housing, we want to make sure that thermal equilibrium has reached before we make this uh, measurement. How we do that, I'll, I'll explain that later on. So transfer tube needs to be as straight as possible. And some of those subtleties that we'll explain as we get to uh, more detail of measurements that we do on um, daily basis before each HDR treatment. So one good way that we can develop confidence in making sure the radiation source goes to where we want it to go is by simply using our iPhone or smartphone. Here I've used a um, source position check ruler and then I place two lead blocks or any type of blocks and then I put my smart smartphone on top of that. And as I have explained here, we can capture a video of where the source actually goes. We can, for example, uh, program our treatment control system to have the source go to 1500, 1490, 1480, and 1470. And then just before the process starts, we start the video capture in our smartphone, we leave the vault, and then we start the process. And so we get a video clip of where everything, how everything is taking place. So this is something that uh, might be of interest to you and you can show that to your colleagues. And I think it, as I said, it develops confidence in making sure we understand where the source goes and where's the exact center of the source. And if it is off more than one millimeter or, or so, which entails calling the engineer to make to return here and adjust it, adjust the position. Any questions so far? 
Okay. Let's move on to dwell time accuracy. The question asked is, after an HDR source exchange, is the dwell time of the HDR source accurate within plus or minus one second? For We have a live demonstration of uh, dwell time measurement. I have uh, provided you with a link here. One of our colleagues has gone through the details of measuring the dwell time accuracy. Based on my experience, dual time accuracy uh, is always spot on. Of course, if you take on transi transition time of the source, and some people use stopwatches, I use the computer real time clock to see uh, if, the accurate, if the time accuracy is intact. And as I have indicated here, it's highly unusual to find uh, time inaccuracy. Everything is digital. And so if you, during your observation of this video, or if you use your watch, uh, stopwatch, if you measure your time accuracy to be larger than two seconds, there is something unusual, either something unusual in our process or something has gone awry in the TCS. I suggest that you repeat that or ask a colleague to take a look at, pardon me, take a look at the uh, process and make sure that everything is being done properly. But again, one easy way to do this test is also program your treatment control system to go to a certain position for five seconds and you can start your stopwatch and see if that source actually stays there for five seconds or 10 seconds before jumping to the next dual position. Okay, measuring the activity of the source. Uh, the question has been posed that after the source exchange, is the measurement of the source strength similar to that reported by the certificate uh, provided by the vendor? And the typical agreement is 2%. Based on our measurements of the last 10 years, it's less than 1%. And of course, the threshold is, it should be less than 5%. But again, if your measurement comes anywhere close, gets to be more than 1% or even close to 2%, I suggest that we review the whole process, make sure that temperature pressure correction has been set properly, the source strength has been entered properly in the Excel spreadsheet, and number of items that we'll go over in our Excel spreadsheet to make sure all of those things are in entered properly. Because as I said, we expect it to be less than 1% difference compared to what the vendor has uh, suggested. So here I've indicated that I will share an Excel spreadsheet, which I will do at the very end. There's also an ex a procedure offered in this web link. I strongly suggest you to pay visit to it. One item I wanted to mention before I go to the next slide about measuring the source strength and before actually we go over some of the nitty gritty clinical aspects of measurement is the use of Curie for the source strength. It's a good idea to start developing the idea of uh, using air kerma strength to indicate what the strength of the source activity is rather than Curie. It's good to know both of them. Many of the physicians or our colleagues are accustomed to Curie, but more and more centers are defining source strength in terms of air kerma strength. Any questions so far? Please let me know if I'm speeding through it or if I'm too slow so I can adjust my presentation. Timer error is what we discussed earlier, namely the dual time accuracy should be better than two seconds. Okay, so let's say the source is exchanged by the uh, engineer and we wanna make sure that uh, we reflect that change properly in all uh, the pertinent documents. So after the source is exchanged, we want to make sure that in the treatment planning system, which in this case could be Uncentra, that is entered correctly. The decay sheet that we place next to the TCS 
it also shows the source activity correctly. And lastly, we want to make sure that all of those match with what the treatment control systems printout of the system overview is intact. So in the case of Uncentra, there is a, a file called RD, RD Store, which I'm sure you know where it's located in your workstation. You go there and you enter the reference error kermo rate according to what's, what appears in the system overview, which comes from your treatment control system. So in this case, looking at system overview, which is a printout of the source information in the treatment control system, it shows that the current activity is 10.915 Curie. It's very important that equal to certain air kerma strength. It's very important that we put this information here. And I will briefly explain to you why the air kerma rate here is different than that. So treatment planning system, the Excel spreadsheet that we place next to the computer, treatment control system. Let me change this to, this is B actually, and this is C. And of course, the system overview. So let's go over some of these subtleties. This, of course, is a simple uh, exercise, which I'm sure all of you guys already do in your practice. Namely, you have an Excel spreadsheet that shows what the source activity according to the certificate was and what the source activity when the source actually got installed in your clinic is. And based on the exponential source decay, you, you know what the expected source activity is. So any day that you want to treat your patient by referring to the date and the source activity and matching it against the treatment control system, you can do a sanity check to make sure that there are no discrepancy. But once done properly in the first step, we shouldn't see any discrepancy of more than maybe 0.5%, if that much. So here I've indicated there are some rounding errors, of course, depending on number of significant figures that you want to use. So let's go into some more detail about some of these items. So I indicated that the certificate for the sealed source comes with the bucket that contains the radiation source. You want, what we have observed is a discrepancy in our certificate for the sealed sources, and I will explain to you shortly here. So we want to make sure that the serial number of the afterloader is correctly recorded here. I have indicated the serial number of the afterloader here. And then the address to which the source is being delivered. This is the discrepancy I was referring to earlier. They have indicated in this certificate for sealed sources, the activity of the source is 11.63 Curie. As I said, we want to refer to air kerma rate as our standard. And they have associated this activity with this air kerma rate. And we have uh, a problem with this. Why? Because when I go through my independent check and I put my air kerma rate constant here, I come up with a 11.765 versus 11.63. And what I've indicated here is that we want to be consistent in our use of constants, activities throughout the whole chain of operation here. So, because we have chosen this as air kerma rate constant, 4.0367, we enter this activity in our treatment planning system. And one might say, wait a second, isn't this the certificate for sealed source ind indicating 11.63? Why would you do that? Well, my response to that is that when the engineer from ELECTA enters the information in our treatment control system, they actually use this air kerma rate constant in the treatment control system. 
why? Because well, the, the reason is uh, so they really come up with a an activity seven point six five that we do, and one might ask why is there a discrepancy between the constant use here and the constant use there? The answer is that Electa hasn't, based on my experience, of course, has not reconciled the two separate portions of the operations by Electa Alpha Omega generates the certificate for sealed source and they have stuck to the reference error thermal error rate constant of a different value which is about one percent uh, higher than this which gives a lower activity here higher in the denominator lower in the net result whereas Electa treatment planning system has continues to use the larger air error air thermal rate constant, hence the larger activity. So we have selected a number of years ago, about 10 years ago, to stay with the higher air thermal rate constant, 4.0367, and therefore we want to stay consistent with determining what the source activity is and then QA it accordingly. So I've indicated here that the source manufacturer and the HDR afterloader, after they have usually about 1% difference in value. You choose which one you want, but stick with that. We've chosen the smaller air thermal rate constant, which yields a higher activity. So in the suggestion section, I've indicated stick to the air thermal rate as the standard, which can resolve many of these issues and stay consistent with defining the source activity. Any question? Okay, so we have exchanged the source. We've put the information in treatment planning system. We have generated the Excel spreadsheet. We have uh, made sure that they match what's the printout from treatment control system offers. So we know that we're in harmony among all these different components. And uh, now we want to essentially run a test to make sure that the, when we do a treatment planning on Uncentra, we can actually export it to treatment control system. And then once we export it to treatment co control system, great, we can bring it up. But gosh, what happens if there is a network issue and for whatever reason, our networks go down. Do we have a backup system to transfer the treatment parameters from Uncentra treatment planning system to the treatment control system? So regarding the network-based transfer, once the treatment planning is completed in Uncentra, we use the proper icon to export the treatment parameters. This is an example of the DICOM file, it's relatively small, 55 kilobytes. And then once we export it, then we have to go to treatment control system and actually import the treatment parameters. As I said briefly, we have to do uh, a test when we initially install the system. We can either ping it or test the exporting data. We wanna make sure that we have a static IP address we want to make sure our IT colleagues assign that static IP address so things don't change. And <clears throat> as I briefly mentioned, if you have a network connectivity issue, we want to make sure that we have a backup plan. So we have to go through the process of saving the treatment parameters in a USB and then take the USB and actually go to the treatment control system, plug the USB in there, and then go and see if you can export the information from the uh, USB information. So this way, the treatment parameters won't be, uh, treatment uh, won't be interrupted. Now, it's very unusual that in the process of export of treatment parameters, any of the treatment parameters get corrupted. It's a fairly small system, but can it happen? Sure, it can happen. I'm sure those of us who have worked with external beam planning, they have no noticed some anomalies, especially if there are some push and pull involved, some rounding up of the error of the monitor units, 
any any funny thing can happen whenever you uh, have different systems or if you push and pull treatment data. So it's very important that when you pull the information into your treatment control system, you want to make sure everything matches with the treatment planning system. Namely, you're using the same number of catheters, the source activity in the treatment planning system, and that in treatment control system match, uh, the prescription doses match. So just a sanity check that when you import everything in tr into control, treatment control system, nothing has changed. This is a display of our workstation where I work here. This is the treatment control system or TCS. That's a, con that's a computer that controls the TCP or treatment control panel. This treatment control panel controls the motion of the source in the afterloader. Uh, that's where all the emergency buttons or interrupt buttons are located. This treatment control system that you see on the top, that's just a display monitor and this is the tower. We have a UPS here just in case we lose power. So let's say if <clears throat> for whatever reason our cancer center loses power using this UPS, we can finish the delivery at least for that channel. We have a printer that we rarely use, but Electa insists that we need to have it. When we finish our treatment, uh, treatment deliveries, we usually save the treatment summary as a PDF, and then we pull that PDF file into our electronic medical record. Uh, so we rarely do anything with paper. And of course, our survey meters. We have a, I have a digital survey meter here so I can turn it on and immediately use it rather than gas-based one, which I have to wait typically about five minutes or so until it stabilizes. This is a uh, display of what you see here on the top here, uh, treatment control system. When you turn on your computer here, it runs through a self-test just to make sure that all the connectivities are intact. It checks the status of the treatment control system, treatment control panel, and the status of the afterloader. Is it is treatment control panel communicating with the afterloader? So here I've indicated, is our system functional? So we run the self-test. We have to run the self-test, otherwise we really uh, cannot deliver the treatment. It, it prevents us from doing that. <clears throat> then we do the source position uh, accuracy, the ruler test I showed earlier, to make sure that all of these burnt marks are within one millimeter of the marked destinations. Then we check the functionality of the interrupt button, namely if the, for whatever reason, if patient is uncomfortable or for whatever reason we have to stop the treatment, does the system work properly? By we press the interrupt button and then we'll see that the source is actually gets drawn back to the afterloader. We can press it again to resume the treatment where it stopped. Okay, so let me see. Daily QA. So this is just a display of what I had shown earlier. Let me enlarge this so you can see that better. <clears throat> so I've indicated that every day I expose four dual positions, one centimeter apart, each for one second. So four burnt marks are made. We skip a day to leave a gap. <clears throat> Pardon me and then repeat that uh, same test the next day. I've indicated here what kind of film we use. You can use either EBT2 films or EBT3 films. Having a film and cutting it and will allow you to run many, many tests and stay, stay within budgets. So in the daily QA, I've indicated what I just described. One thing about the thermal equilibrium, and which I briefly mentioned earlier, is this. 
But you notice that this is the housing for our afterloader. This is the pig that we have to always have available for radiation safety purposes. We have drilled a couple of holes here around the housing and we keep the telescope here open. Why? Because that radiation source as it's decaying, it generates heat and it can uh, adversely affect the precision of the dual position. So this will help keep inside of the housing fairly cool. So here for the, I've described why we use a well chamber, frequency of calibration, it's cross calibration, do we use current or charge, and the sweet spot. Clearly all of you have some of these equipment. I'd be more than happy to go uh, over this. I hate to read over the things that you can read yourself. I simply want to point to the salient and important points for each one of these items. So if I'm skipping too many things, please stop me and let me know. But in short, regarding this very slide, uh, we use well chambers, which I briefly described in here. That's a well chamber. We use an HDR uh, well chamber from standard imaging. And we use uh, max 4000 electrometer. We usually send the well chamber and the electrometer in tandem to the calibration laboratory. And we ask the calibration laboratory to calibrate uh, the electrometer both for high and low current values. We do that every other year. In US, we have to calibrate this every year. Survey meters, we have to calibrate it every year, but electrometer and well chamber every other year. When these return from calibration, I typically use a different electrometer to essentially repeat my QA making sure both of these electrometer, this electrometer and the secondary electrometer read the same values. This uh, helps as a cross calibration and backup if something goes haywire with the first unit, I always have the second unit to refer to. We use current for a measurement of the activity. And of course, every time we send the source to the well chamber, we have to determine where the sweet spot is and send it there. And I will explain to you in an Excel spreadsheet, uh, how do we determine where the sweet spot is. A couple of interesting points, which I had not mentioned in the PowerPoint, I had shared with you earlier and my good colleague Adam brought to my attention, which I need to emphasize is that these are some of the, of course, temperature pressure correction, all of us are familiar with, even for external treatment planning. But for P-ion and polarity, it's very important to, not to use them in the case of HDR measurement. Why? Because whenever you look at the calibration certificate that comes from the accredited dosimetry calibration certificate, they don't use cobalt-60 for measurement. They use HDR system. And unlike the external beam planning system that we have to go through this, for the HDR system, we don't do this. So here I've indicated use P-ion and P-polarity only if needed, which I will explain to you when that might be needed. This is the Excel spreadsheet. Oops, sorry. This is the formula, rather, that we use to determine the air kerma rate of the iridium source, which later on, some of us may want to also convert that to uh, activity in Curie. I've indicated what each one of these items are and how to measure them. Again, I will share this updated uh, PowerPoint with you. It has a little more detail, which you might find useful. This is the air kerma rate uh, constant I was referring to, which Electa uses, but the source manufacturer uses a different value, which is slightly higher than that about 1% higher than that. So here I've indicated that uh, for one over A ion, don't use it if AD, ADCL certificate doesn't show that. Again, I will explain to you what I mean in that Excel spreadsheet that will go over the actual calculation of the 
activity of the source. Next slide shows that if you have to use P polarity and P ion, this is the procedure that you have to go through. But again, I've indicated only if, during, if it is used by ADCL. Okay, this essentially completes my presentation about accepting a new HDR source. We have gone through the process of making sure that Iridium-192 is actually delivered to us. It's in the activity that we expect. And once, we, once the electro engineer has exchanged the source, a number of tests that we go through for position and timing to make sure that it meets our uh, standards. So if you have uh, no question, I'd be more than happy to bring up an Excel spreadsheet and go over the procedure that we go through when the source is actually given to the physicist to validate what ELECTA claims to be the source activity. Um, if everybody hey, Kevin. has any questions, this is Mike. can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. Okay, I just wanted to comment uh, regarding source position accuracy. I see the system you're using, your Electa Micros Electron, older variant systems, for instance, the Verisource has, I think, a camera system built into the afterloader itself where the dummy wire source position as well as the active wire source position is checked via um, an image taken during the morning QA check. So just an FYI, you may have that. And other users that have perhaps the uh, Flexitron from Electra, they usually install a camera in the room that looks directly at a check ruler that's mounted to a wall underneath the camera. And you can hook up your transfer guide tube to that check ruler and ask the source to go out, say, to 1,200 millimeters and visually also capture an image. So some sites may not require uh, film on a daily basis, and, but, but that's definitely good how you showed it and how you can make your homemade film strips on gaff chromic film and thereby be you know, fiscally very responsible instead of spending a lot of money on that. So I just wanted to make everyone aware that some sites may not require film. Okay, thanks. I agree with you. I think that's a great solution that uh, Varian has come up with, namely the camera and being able to capture the image of the camera that will do, do away with all of these physical uh, inventory. Any other question or comments, colleagues? And if anyone has a question, they can just type it in the chat. Okay. Allow me to show you an Excel spreadsheet that we use here. Oh, Kevin, I think they just typed in a question. Please. It says, does the dwell position accuracy affected with the temperature of the room? Yes, it does. One of the um, reasons I suggested the, this configuration in which two, at least two holes are drilled in the HDR afterloader housing is because of that. Namely, as the source decays, it generates heat. And based on our observation, it can adversely affect the positional accuracy of the source. So what we've done is we've drilled uh, a pair of holes. And also there is a telescope window here that we keep open. So this kind of helps the air ventilation. And we have seen that improve the positional accuracy. Namely, let's say we come Monday after two days of weekend in a closed system of afterloader housing, we've noticed that the positional accuracy didn't match what we had measured on Thursday and Friday prior. And of course, it takes some time for it to reach its thermal equilibrium. 
And after a number of observations, we came up with this solution. So the short answer is yes, but there is a simple solution for that. And as my colleague mentioned, many of these things that, well, all the things that I'm discussing is really pointed toward Micros Electron, Electa by Electa. Many of these overlap with variants, but clearly some of these <clears throat> approaches that variant users, <clears throat> pardon me, employ are a bit different than that. So if you are using a variant system, please ask questions and my colleagues can address them. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, process flow for Excel spreadsheet, uh, using an Excel spreadsheet. I, the first thing that we use when we <clears throat> receive uh, a radiation source or HDR radiation source is to measure a transport index. And according to local laws, we have to do that within three hours after arrival of the source. So <clears throat> I wanted to, <clears throat> pardon me, I wanted to share this uh, rare case with you in which TI actually failed. In overwhelming majority of the cases, 95, 96, 90, even higher percentages, TI passes, but at times it does fail. So in this case, uh, one of my colleagues <clears throat> measured the transport index at uh, different card at four cardinal angles. <clears throat> pardon me, and recorded them and came up with a with an average transport index of 0.65. Our threshold is 0.6, and therefore it failed. What that means is that <clears throat> the container that's holding the HDR source is not attenuating the uh, radiation as much as one would have expected. Having said that, we contacted, <clears throat> pardon me, Electa, explained the situation, and only, I think, the last year or so, they uh, increased the transport index threshold from 0.6 to 0.7 in, in our locality. It used to be 0.6, now it's 0.7. Having said that, the Electa user's manual still warns the user to make sure transport index stays below 0.6. So what do we actually do if it fails? We really can't do anything. What we, in this case, we did was we made our colleagues aware that this bucket that holds the radioactive source is secured in our hot lab. We typically put it behind the shield. Again, we brought to their attention that transport index is a little higher. And we also bring, uh, brought it up to the attention of the engineer from Electa that paid a visit hey, uh, Kevin. a couple of days later to install this. And we also let the radiation safety officer in Electa know about this thing. If it were me, I would make the buckets a little thicker in as far as lead shielding is concerned to make sure it falls below 0.6 and also make sure that the personnel involved in transport of this, in this case, FedEx would be aware that transport index is a little higher. But again, this is a rare occurrence, but we typically measure about 0 0.7, I mean, sorry, 0 0.57, 0 0.58, 0 0.56, just below the 0 0.6 threshold. In this case, it was a little higher. And look at the heterogeneity in measurements. So that means they're not using a, the source or the shielding is not uniform throughout the bucket or the position of the source. Here we have explained, you know, where to place the radiation survey meter, and we make sure that the calibration of the radiation survey meter is up to date. When we received it, when we measured it. Okay. Uh, this Excel spreadsheet, which I will share with you through my colleagues in Rays of Hope, is essentially similar to what I had mentioned earlier there were a couple of uh, minor uh, improvements that's been done in it, which I will explain to you. 
here we've indicated to enter data in colored cells only, namely the green ones. So what kind of electrometer are you using? What kind of bell chamber are you using? What's the source activity according to the printout from treatment control system? The date associated with that activity, what the temperature and pressure are, and then of course a series of measurements. The rest of these are calculated automatically and you can of course click on any of these and learn what the equation is used in calculating these values. We want to make sure that the calibration time and date are entered especially very carefully, very accurately. We have to find out the time difference, for example, in Netherlands relative to Texas, and just make sure that everything is properly entered. Now, you know, as far as calibration of the activity of the source, we don't know where the sweet spot is. Well, we have a general idea, but <clears throat> depending on the setup, the sweet spot could be a little different. So what we do is we send a source in dual positions of five um, millimeters to different parts of the well chamber. And what I had shown earlier It's actually a setup like this. So we have the afterloader, we have the proper transfer tube for source activity measurement. So we send the source to the most distal position and then we step it every five millimeters. So we send it here, most distal position, <clears throat> have it stay there for 10 seconds. We measure the charge, we see what the charge is being displayed here and we record it then in the treatment control system, we see the source jumps one centimeter or 10 millimeter to the next dual position and stays there for 10 seconds. We record the charge and we do that for a number of steps as shown here. And clearly by looking at this, we see that the source is reaching the sweet spot, which gives us the, which gives us the largest current value. So, and then of course, beyond the sweet spot, the value decreases. And then this Excel spreadsheet finds the maximum reading and goes through the charge to current conversion. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Hi, sorry, are we supposed to be looking at an Excel sheet with you? Yes, can you not see the Excel spreadsheet? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Now I can. Now I can see it. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure, sure. Of course. All right. So very briefly in this Excel spreadsheet, we put the information about the electrometer used, well chamber used, the source activity that comes from treatment control system, not from the source certificate, because treatment control system holds the source information that we also entered in TPS earlier. Of course, temperature and pressure correction. And then once we put all these information, again, A ion is zero, no correction for ion or P polarity. And then we step the radiation source through the transfer tube and uh, we record the charge collected. The Excel spreadsheet finds the maximum value and then converts the charge to current we record when we actually took these measurements. As I said, we enter data in colored cells. And then uh, we see what the difference is between the measured value of activity and the reported value of the activity. And we report here if the measurement, the measurement is within 5%. Again, we based on our, measure, our 10 plus years of using the system, we are I would say overwhelming majority of the time, 95, 97% of the time, within, well within 1%. At times when we have extreme temperature, pressure, it might uh, go a little beyond 1%, but definitely nowhere close to 2%. So even though the threshold is 5%, be aware if your measurement comes out to be too different than the expected measurement. So my colleague measured it, I double checked it, 
and that's the date that uh, the measurement took place. So transport index was measured, source activity was, was measured, and then and validated. Then we go through the, the quarterly check of the system. Have you measured the source strength? Interlocks are operational. The control unit, time accuracy and positional accuracy have been verified. Different control, different systems, treatment planning system, treatment panel system, and TPS are communicating with each other. Survey results are favorable. <clears throat> we input the information in treatment uh, console, and also we updated the information in an independent Excel spreadsheet that we've developed to check the TPS. We also want to make sure that that's also entered correctly. Since I mentioned it, we use RadCalc. That's the software that we use. So every time we generate a treatment plan for, let's say, Mrs. Jones, before we treat Mrs. Jones, we export the treatment parameters from the tre treatment planning system to RadCalc and make sure that the results are well within 3%. We typically see them well within 0.5% and then proceed to treatment. And then we wanna make sure that all the documentations are in place for our own policy and procedures and also for inspection purposes. Lastly, we generate the Excel spreadsheet that I briefly mentioned. Again, what we see here should be well within 0.1, uh, 0.2% of what the treatment control system reports in ELECTA. There are some rounding errors, but here we have indicated what the um, location is, what the afterloader serial number is, so we don't mix up Excel spreadsheets, what's the source serial number. So this afterloader is always associated with this site, but the source changes. What air karma rate constant that we use, and of course, what the half-life of the radioactive source is, just to make sure that we are talking about iridium. These show the exponential decay. When the source was actually calibrated in the accelerator, and then when it, when it was actually installed. And again, I'd be more than happy to, I think I shared this earlier, but if you have any question uh, about any of these Excel spreadsheets, please contact me and I'd be more than happy to share it through my colleagues in Rays of Hope or through directly to you. So with the completion of review of the Excel spreadsheets, I'd like to open the discussion to any question that you might have about this topic. And sorry about my misspellings. So let me open up the, ask you a couple of questions, if I may. Could those of you who have already started using HDR program simply raise your hand? Great. And for those of you who have actually started using HDR program using Electa brand of HDR, could you raise your hand? Great, great. So I'm glad that you had exposure to some of these topics earlier. I trust that you've started to use. I think somebody might have a question. Maybe not. Okay, go ahead, please. Well, sorry, I have one question. Uh, I want to ask you, there are three kind of three 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 type of measuring air air karma strains air karma strains in air and in well chamber. Also, we have a, another way that we can measure air karma strains in the phantom. Th this is a German way. I think uh, uh, the Bebic uh, company we have we we measured air karma strains by using a farmer ionization chamber. 
I want to ask you which way, in your opinion, which way is better and why? I see. One of my colleagues, uh, Adam Schulman, uh, has a great uh, presentation about this very topic that you mentioned, uh, which you may or may not have that presentation. I like to bring it up, but I'll, I'll give you the answer. And I agree with Adam. He discourages using ion chamber. And he explains that in his PowerPoint presentation. If you have a couple of uh, minutes, I can bring it, bring it up and actually point you to why he recommends his suggestion. Is it okay? S sorry. Let me open up this Excel. So the, the short answer to your question is that we highly recommend using, do not use, not to use the farmer type ion chamber. We use the value that's given to us by uh, accredited dosimetry laboratory. And if I may, I'd like to show you a couple of slides which explains why that's the case. But if it goes beyond the scope of this conversation, uh, we can follow up this topic after this presentation on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay, okay. So, okay, but at least good. allow me to show you that Excel spreadsheet that Adam shared earlier. It seems that I'm having difficulty finding that uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this is my email address. If you send me an email at the end, I'd be more than happy to share that with you. And I think it has lots of information about the air thermal rate or strength measurements, different ways of doing that, and why we think using an ADCL and using an HDR system and unit is the best way of doing that. So please send me an email after this presentation, and we can continue this conversation after that. Did you hear me? Habir, did you did you did you hear me? My my internet connection is too slow. Yes, I will I will I will send you the detail of the way that we will measure that we measured the air care masters. I will be happy to to share information and to 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 know your comment about our results. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for you. Thank you for your presentation. Sure. Colleagues, any other question or comments? I, and I want to mention that we don't have a well chamber, so we have to measure in phantom method. I see. In our, in our department, there is no well chamber. So if we don't have well, well chamber, so we, we use this Krieger phantom. It's, 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 it's a kind of phantom that five hole inside it. So we put it, uh, the applicator in, in the middle of the hole and the uh, iron chamber in another hole in, in front of the uh, applicator. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'm fairly familiar with that approach. In fact, in uh, Adam's presentation, he emphasizes that you need to really press the hospital administration to purchase you a well chamber. I think yes. it's very, very important. Yes. Any other question or comments, colleagues? Let me bring up that outline of presentation. These were the things we talked about.
Okay, if uh, there are no questions or comments, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and I look forward to our next encounter. Thank you so much, Kevin. This was great. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.